Hi, I'm Karen McNeil. Welcome to WineSpeed.com's People to Know, insider interviews with the most fascinating and important people in the wine business. And today we're in the Willamette Valley with Claire Carver, who is the co-proprietor of Big Table Farm, one of the most celebrated small wineries in the Willamette Valley. Um, very highly uh, thought of, highly rated. In fact, um, Claire, you, um, your wines have been in several top 100 lists this last couple of years. But you and your husband, Brian, have been, um, have been at it for, for a good decade. Um, why do you think, um, why is it only now that people are realizing, in a sense, the brilliance of your wines? Um, the, the, uh, so Brian started in wine in 1996, and uh, one of the people he worked for was Helen Turley. And she had a, a response one time when someone asked her a really similar question. And her quote was, oh, yeah, I'm an overnight success, 30 years in the making, yeah. or something like that. <laughs> and I think sometimes it's mm. critical momentum. But I do also think winemakers get better. Mm -hmm. God, I hope we do, right? Yes. And as an artist, I get better. And just as a creative person, and you, as long as you're someone who's striving, you're constantly self-criticizing in a positive way so that you can move forward. I think that's a really important thing to Brian and I as business owners, mm -hmm. is we're always pushing each other and critically looking at our work and trying to make it better. And I've watched our wine style change significantly in the, so we've been here in Oregon for 14 years now, um, and in Napa 10 before that, and in those years in Oregon, there's definitely been stylistic changes and hopefully improvements in our wine. So I'd like to think that it's a combination of um, people getting to know who we are, us making a little more wine so it's a little more available, and then hopefully just becoming better winemakers. Yeah. Now, I remember the very first time I saw a bottle of your wine, I looked at that label and I thought, oh my God, who did this? I mean, these labels are just so beautiful. If you have not seen a Big Table Farm label, you, you, don't, you, you actually don't want to open the bottle. You oh, just want to put you. that bottle right up on, uh, on, on your shelf. It is really extraordinary artwork. How do you... I, are you, I'm imagining you're sitting in a little studio somewhere. How do you do these labels? I do, I do have a studio. I actually start thinking about the labels in the spring um, because they're due to my printmaker by the end of the summer. And then it actually takes her most of the fall and winter to actually print them because they're hand printed. Mm. Um, so I start sort of conceptualizing them even now um, and take the, take the photo reference and start working on sketches and ideas. Um, but I do, I have a working studio in our farmhouse and I've actually just expanded and I have a new studio in Carleton that I work at where I do my oil painting as well. And then the process, so they're hand letter pressed, which is amazing. She, I've been in very tight communication with her because they're due here in the next four days. Um, and then starting the last week in January, Brian and I uh, hire some uh, temporary folks that work with us shoulder to shoulder, seven hours a day, five days a week for four weeks. Putting and them on? We put every oh single God. label on by hand and then we wrap every single bottle in paper because they're pieces of artwork and they will actually tear. They're not traditional labels, they're, they're letter press pieces of art. And so even the wrapping takes, the wrapping actually takes 1.5 times longer than the hand labeling. We have it all worked out. So we have three people hand labeling and four people wrapping. Wow. And we unbox every bottle wrap them all by hand and put them back in boxes for people to have throughout the year. Well, so. they are extraordinary. They are extraordinary. Now, on your LinkedIn page, you describe yourself as the, oh God. He the, head, <laughs> the head wife. Oh. And when I read that, I thought, wait a minute, this, this woman knows how to castrate bulls and slaughter pigs. I mean, how did you come to uh, describe yourself as, as head the head wife. wife? I don't even know where that came from. That's really funny. I have looked at my LinkedIn page in 10 years. The head wife. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I actually don't see wife as a disparaging or belittling title at all. Mm -hmm. You know, and my husband and I are such equals and we always, I joke around a lot that I do a lot of the blue jobs like you just described, you mm -hmm. know, I do the chores. 
Yeah. And, and I do the care and feeding of the animals. And he does the grocery shopping and the majority of the cooking when it's not harvest. I do the cooking when it's harvest, which, if, I mean, I hate to even say traditionally jobs that women do because like, so many things are shifting yeah. in this day and age that it's just not, it's not even, I don't know. It's not even a relevant conversation, but I don't know where I came up with head wife, as if there's another wife. I know. I, I thought do, about that, I, too. I do I have a running joke Excuse with me. my husband that he could have another wife as long as I'm the head wife, <laughs> which I, maybe that's where it came from. Of course, my husband's the last person on the planet who would have another wife, but um, yeah, I, that's, it's, maybe I should change that. <laughs> well. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about how you designed and built your winery, because for a time you made wine in, in another facility. We did, yeah. Uh, ooh, that's a long story. How much time do we have? Yeah, only a short amount of time. <laughs> okay. Um, so there were multiple things. When we started our business, I think you know this, we started with $5,000. And so we were custom crushed. We started with only 150 cases. So we just did not have the money to build a winery, period. Um, and we grew out of our facility and our rent was so high that it was basically a mortgage payment. But even at that point, we didn't have enough m money saved in our business savings to even do a construction project. So uh, we kind of kind of he kept hitting walls with banks. And at that time, this was in 2013, uh, a lot of crowdfunding was happening. And I said to Brian, let's just try this. And he said, okay, but if, if you get anybody to do it, which I don't think you will, you have to cap it at 100 people. I'm like, okay, fine. So within six weeks, we had 100 people who gave us $1,700 each. And that was the large part of the capital, including our own money and then a loan against our house um, with which to build the winery. So that it is a lot of money, but it's not a huge budget. So the winery had to be lean and mean, mm -hmm. but at the same time we needed to build something that uh, paid respect to the history of our homestead. We live uh, in this beautiful homestead, 70 acres. The house was built in 1890. So we designed the winery to look like the barn that we had built on the property to replicate the historic barn. Um, so we spent a lot of time driving around the county and looking at barns and sort of understanding that architecture. So it's a very simple building from the outside. It looks like a barn. Inside, it's all timber frame. Um, the walls are actually made of structural insulated panels. So the energy use is very, very low. The main part of the winery is heated and cooled with one mini split, which is amazing, and mm. some fans. Um, so very well insulated. Um, all the gutters are tied together for water catchment, and we've just finished the solar project. So it is a uh, it is a building with uh, with almost no footprint, and that was definitely a goal. Yeah, how incredible! Um, why is Oregon so <coughs> exciting at the moment? I mean, I I think about. Um, you know, so many major articles in the last year, including some I think that I've contributed to, um, have named Oregon and specifically the Willamette Valley as one of, if not the most exciting wine region in America. What do you think is making it so exciting right now? I think um, people love stories. Mm. And stories are really important to wine because they inspire us. It's what we were talking about earlier. You, you're relaxed and inspired when you have a glass of wine. And um, a story of you know, small businesses or entrepreneurs or people who are farming or people who are um, setting out into their business in a very creative way that um, uh, reflects their personality in an intimate way is a, you're able to do that in Oregon because it's still relatively affordable compared to some other regions. And so there's a little more creative freedom um, to, because you're not so hamstrung by just these insurmountable budgets. Mm. And, and I, that, I, that's just my little lens. I mean, that's where Brian and I had come from. And so that's the, that's the story that I tell, that, that's my own experience that people have resonated with. So that's, that's my only lens. And so I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from people who visited like, oh, that's why we come to Oregon because we meet people like you and Brian who are, who've run your own path creatively. And I feel like 
n n not being hemmed in by debt and stress about money. I mean, there's always stress about money, but um, being in a region where we could get in at the ground floor without a huge investment or, you know, any financial backing is exciting. Yeah, yeah. So that's just my own experience. Thank yeah. you, Claire. Well, our complete interview with Claire Carver of Big Table Farm is at winespeed.com's People to Know page. You'll really enjoy it.